Following the recent crisis, involving a ship grounding in the Suez Canal, the entire world was transfixed as events unfolded. It became increasingly evident that the canal's importance cannot be overstated, as even a temporary closure could significantly impact the global economy. While the Suez Canal has experienced several closures throughout its history, including a lengthy one after the 1967 war, the recent incident highlighted just how crucial it is to keep the canal operational at all times. This raises an interesting question. If the world cannot tolerate even a brief closure of the canal, how did we manage to endure an eight-year closure in the past? The answer lies with a man often referred to as the king of transport, who played a pivotal role in ensuring that the world's shipping industry could no longer tolerate even the slightest interruption. In fact, when he passed away, the cargo ships of the world blew their whistle in mourning. Today, it's worth taking a closer look at the transportation sector and shipping industry. Although many of us may not give much thought to this sector, it has played a crucial role in the rise of many countries, including China, Japan, and numerous others. Once upon a time, there was a young man named Malcolm McLean who graduated from high school in the year 1931, which was during the Great Depression in America, despite his eagerness to find a job. The scarcity of work opportunities was evident everywhere. After some persistent searching, McLean landed a job at a gas station, where he witnessed someone earning $5 per trip for transporting oil with a truck. This sparked an idea in him but he lacked the essential resources to execute it, namely a truck. However, he remembered that his employer had an old truck in storage, which he could repair and use for the same purpose. After speaking to the owner, Malcolm McLean got the truck for a reasonable price and started transporting goods, including vegetables and oil, with it. He eventually purchased more trucks and even hired staff to work for him within five years. McLean had become a successful entrepreneur. One of McLean's most challenging journeys was transporting something that was meant to be shipped by boat, where he had to wait in a long queue for dock workers to manually transfer the contents. Although he sensed a better way to transport goods, he remained focused on his work. In 1940, World War II began, and the United States prepared for it. With many businessmen benefiting from the war, including McLean, before the war. He owned 30 trucks and generated revenues of $120,000. After the war, he owned 160 the trucks and generated revenues exceeding $2 million, becoming one of the top five largest trucking companies in America, owning 37 transport stations and more than 1,770 trucks in the mid-1950s. However, new laws on roads especially on trucks, with additional weight fees, began to harm his business. Remembering an idea he had 15 years ago about maritime shipping, McLean decided to unload boxes on the truck and put them on a ship. This way, he could stack the boxes together and make the transportation much safer. Unfortunately, U.S. laws hindered him from entering both sectors and controlling them, forcing him to choose between continuing with the trucking sector or entering the shipping sector from scratch. Despite the dilemma, McLean sold his share in the big trucking company he owned for $25 million and secured a $42 million loan from the bank. He bought a shipping company that had rights to dock ships in American ports for $7 million and renamed it Sealand Service. McLean also developed the container, designed it with an engineer, and patented it. However, he needed a ship to transport the containers, leading him to modify two oil tankers. On April 26, 1956, the first McLean ship sailed from New York to Houston, loaded with 58 containers, and he signed significant contracts for transporting goods using the new method. Even before the ship arrived, McLean was astonished by the surge in orders. So, to encourage even more sales, he introduced a 25% discount on standard shipping. It's worth mentioning that, 
Before the advent of the McLean concept, the cost of shipping a ton by ship was $5.86. However, after McLean, the cost fell to a mere 16 cents per ton. This significant reduction means that 75% of the previous cost was attributed to workers who unloaded the ships, which used to take a lengthy 20 days, but with the McLean concept, it now only takes 24 hours. There's simply no comparison between the two methods. Despite these advancements, there remained one issue, the infrastructure of the ports at the time. The ports were not equipped to handle the McLean concept, and the U.S. government's response to developing them was weak. Unfortunately, officials couldn't be convinced of the concept's benefits. However, during the Vietnam War, when America became heavily involved, he provided a valuable service. This was a golden opportunity for McLean and other shipping companies to reap significant benefits. Due to the war, in early 1965, America decided to dispatch swift reinforcements to its forces in Vietnam, resulting in a considerable number of soldiers stationed there, who required supplies such as food, ammunition, and weapons. However, Vietnam only had one large port, which was facing issues, a dysfunctional railway line, and few well-paved roads. These challenges presented a massive problem for America, which needed to send reinforcements and supplies quickly. The U.S. military began to consider solutions to this problem. Anne McLean offered to build a port in southern Vietnam to transport all the necessary supplies. After a brief deliberation, the U.S. military accepted McLean's offer, and a port was built. McLean continued to work with the U.S. military until the end of the war, transporting 1,200 containers monthly, which accounted for approximately 40% of McLean's revenue from the Vietnam War. McLean was responsible for delivering supplies to 540,000 American soldiers and personnel. Malcolm McLaren's remarkable intelligence was instrumental during this period to increase revenue. He suggested that the MP ships returning from Vietnam should not return empty, but instead travel to Japan to load products there. McLaren worked closely with the Japanese and built a modern port there. During the 70s, Japan experienced an export boom to America and the rise and prosperity of Japan which shows that McLaren and his ideas contributed to the rise of nations. McLaren's approach in Japan was similar to that in Hong Kong and other places, leading to significant connectivity between countries worldwide. The shipping industry has emerged as a lucrative business, attracting numerous entrepreneurs and big names to invest in new businesses from scratch. These investors are willing to spend a lot of money on new ships, designed explicitly for transportation purposes. Unlike old ships that were retrofitted for such use, however, this approach does not work for new entrants who face tough competition from established companies. In the past, companies that built large container ships had an edge over their competitors. Still, Maersk Line emerged as a strong competitor that require financial support from R.G. Reynolds, a cigarette company that diversified its investments after a surge that harmed its interests about the link between smoking and diseases in 1956. The maritime shipping industry was a promising market at the time, and many companies entered the market, such as R.G. Reynolds, which bought McLean Company for over $1 billion and remained him involved in its management. In 1969, McLean had a lot of money and wanted to build eight new ships that would be the world's largest and fastest. However, the new management of Reynolds decided to operate independently, distancing themselves from McLean's vision. The situation worsened after the October War of 1973 in Egypt, which caused oil prices to increase for times, making it a significant disaster for shipping companies. The shipping industry collapsed globally and many companies went bankrupt or merged to survive. McLean tried to save the company, but Renault's management did not implement any of his suggestions. He sold his shares, taking almost $160 million and left after he left.
President Anwar Sadat reopened the Suez Canal in 1975, and shipping companies resumed operations. McLean attempted to make a comeback in the mid-80s, with a new company that received significant funding. But he could not keep up with the rapid changes happening in the industry. Nowadays, closing the Suez Canal, even for just an hour, can cost the world a lot, threatening some companies while benefiting others, particularly with current oil prices and the world's reliance on speedy delivery. One of the companies that suffered was McLean's company, firstly because its founder and idea's owner walked away, and secondly, because the new management did not know how to compete in the market or stand up against the new Asian and European companies that emerged. The company fell apart after five years, and one of the American railway companies bought it when it deteriorated in 1999. Eventually, it fell under the control of the giant shipping company, Maersk, the largest container transport company globally. This is the narrative of a visionary whose uncomplicated notion revolutionized the entire world. If you relish today's episode, kindly show your support by hitting the like and subscribe buttons, provided that you found it beneficial. Thank you.